This is Bible Academy. Today we begin Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us so we can get the most out of our Bible study. Let's pray. <clears throat> well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity, the privilege, and all the things you provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by looking at our outline. We're getting a more general outline here, uh, looking at the overall picture of the book. We're at point five, D, and we'll begin warnings and encouragements in verse one, chapter 12, verse one. And here we're going to learn some lessons on hypocrisy and timidity. Jesus has been confronting the Pharisees about their hypocrisy and the damage they do. Now Jesus will turn to his own disciples for some more direct lessons for them. He begins by giving them a personal warning. We get a setting and then the warning, verse one. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people, of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, guard yourselves from the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We see here that Jesus's popularity is on the rise. It won't last. He knows that, by the way. The crowds are growing. It's described here as thousands of people, perhaps 10,000 of, of people, stepping on each other to see Jesus. He first turns his attention to his disciples. So with all these people around, he's still going to target these lessons towards his disciples. They can see what they're gonna to have to face. Right now, the priority is to teach them because they're going to carry on after he's gone. After this, beginning in verse 13, he'll turn back to the crowds. So here he instructs his disciples with the phrase, guard yourselves from the leaven of the Pharisees. Then he says, which is hypocrisy. Let's talk about the word guard yourselves for a moment. Two words. Prosecco. Prosecco. Be concerned, be alert, pay close attention, Continue in close attention. It's a present imperative. Beware. Beware is not a bad translation. Except what I want you to see is the next word, which is yourselves. That's why I use the word guard. To say beware yourselves isn't really as good English as guard yourselves, but the idea behind this is you need to pay attention to yourself on this. Don't get into that trap. Don't fall in with the leaven. Now, leaven is usually yeast put in dough to make it ferment and rise. It permeates the dough and changes it. So Jesus is drawing an analogy between leaven in dough with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the influence they have over people. Once one begins to be hypocritical, it changes a person for the worst. It permeates his being so that he begins to think, speak, and act hypocritically. He learns to be someone he really is not. This is one of the evils of religion. It shapes one to be hypocritical. One learns to live a double life. The hypocrite appears to be one person on the outside, but someone else on the inside. It's very easy to fall in the trap of hypocrisy, pretend to be someone else you're not, especially when it's a basic characteristic of religious people and you're among them. Uh, 
just see what happens during a holiday when you're around family and how the hypocrisy comes out. Uh, to live that way all the time, well, a lot of people do it on a regular basis. But it's typical of people who are religious. Now I'll explain this in more depth as we go through this passage. Verse 2 tells us there's no point in being hypocritical. Luke chapter 12, verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, nor hidden that shall not be known. Pretty simple understanding of this. There's nothing covered. The word for covered, I'll put it up here. Sukalupto, completely concealed. The other word is very similar, nor hidden. We'll just talk about that word. Uh, that shall not be known, hidden, kept no, unknown or secret. That shall not be known, that is, by God. So the parallel statement emphasizes that nothing will be concealed forever. It will all come out, especially at the judgment. So the lesson is, why even pretend to be a hypocrite? God knows it all, and it will all come out. Verse 3, conclusion, therefore what you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what are and whatever you have spoken to the ear, which means whispered, in an inner room shall be proclaimed on the housetops. First line, therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. To contrast the darkness and the light, it will be made known. In the dark has, again, the idea of being secret. You're trying to keep it away from people. Then we have a parallel statement, another one. And whatever you have spoken to the ear, that's an idiom for whispering to somebody up close, and you do that in a, in a room, in private. So whispering something in the most private room in the house shall be proclaimed on the housetops. It will become a public proclamation. Now, the idea is that whatever is spoken or heard in secret will be made known publicly. That's what this is saying. Well, does this mean that all your sins and good and bad will be publicly uh, broadcast in the future to, for everyone to hear? I don't think that's the point. But it might as well be, because God already knows it. So why pretend before people when the most important one is God and he knows what you're doing in secret? You see, that's what we're supposed to understand out of this. There's no point in hiding who you really are. God knows it all, and it will be reflected in your judgment. Verse 4, Jesus continues to speak. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. Jesus begins by saying, I tell you, friends, only place to use here between Jesus and the disciples. These are those who are closest to him, his disciples. The lesson is simple. Do not fear those who kill the body. Now that's a lot easier said than done. I mean, we fear all kinds of things for our human body, whether it be pain and suffering, or the stress of everyday life, or not getting the bills paid, or something else that scares us. For someone to threaten us, well, that takes it all up a level. Now this is an imperative. Believers are commanded not to fear physical death. This is a command. Now let's follow through with the thinking here. And after that have nothing more they can do. That means whatever's killed you, they can't do anything else. There's nothing else they can do. You're dead. If they want to cut up the body or mutilate the body or burn the body, it makes no difference. You're not there. You done left the house. No more threats. 
no more pain or torture or suffering. It's over with permanently. Verse 5 brings in a contrast. Now listen, the disciples are told three times about fear here. Basically, they're told not to fear. But I warn you whom you should fear. Here's what you should fear. Who's, here's whom you should fear. Fear the one after the killing, whatever's killed you, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now the yes there, of course, is for emphasis. Let's take it a line at a time. But I will warn you whom you should fear. This is a warning. A stern warning. Fear the one, this is God, after the killing. Again, it doesn't say who. It could be God. The point is that you're dead. You're killed. After death, the one you are to fear is the one who has authority to throw you into hell. The word here for hell is Gehenna. This is a Greek transliteration of a Hebrew title for this place, Gehinnom. It is the Valley of Hinnom. Let me get this up here. Gehinnom, the Valley of Hinnom. This was a valley on the south side of Jerusalem. In the Old Testament times, it was used for human sacrifices to the pagan god Molech. You can look at Jeremiah 7.31, 19.5-6, and 32.35. It was a bull-shaped idol. It was so called this because of the cries of the little children who were thrown into the fiery arms of Molech. 2 Kings 23.10 It came to be a place where executed criminals, where their bodies were thrown, rubbish, human excrement, and it was all burned. It was said to constantly burn. This was to keep the smell, the putrefaction down. Now in the, no, in the New Testament, it became symbolic of the place of divine punishment, as well as the fires, a symbol of continuous burning in the place of divine punishment. So what Jesus has given is a solemn double warning. Do not fear the persecutors or their murderers, those people who do things to you. Now let me just say this. If you are right with God, if you are doing His will, you have nothing to fear. Now if you aren't doing His will and you're doing something stupid, like you decide to go rob a bank, well, you have good reason to fear from the law and from divine discipline, you see. But if you're doing God's will, you're living the righteous life, you have nothing and no reason to fear death. The last warning Jesus gives, I'll put it up there by itself, yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear God. Now, Jesus is speaking this, so he'll be talking about God the Father. Now, we understand God as uh, three persons uh, in one. Jesus Christ will judge everyone for their final and eternal destination. He's the one that will be feared then. We fear in the sense that he has the authority to decide who gets punished or not, who gets cast into hell or not. Now as a Christian, if you're faithful all your life, you'll be at complete peace about all of this. But here's the one thing we do not want to forget here. If we are trusting God, we have no reason to fear. 
When we learn to fear God in the sense of respecting and revering Him, knowing that His decision is what really counts, fearing Him more than what man can do to us, then that fear of men and death is easily overcome. And then there's another side to this. We have a Heavenly Father who cares for us right now on earth while we're in these mortal bodies. Now before we continue, note how all these lessons point to the future. When what is hidden shall be made known, what said will be heard in the light, the secrets shall be proclaimed. Thrown into hell. That's in, that's in the future as well. All point to future judgment. So the future is in mind here. Verse 6 gives us a reason we're not to fear. Here we see God's care for us. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. The word for sparrows. Let me show this to you. Struthion. The idea is that these birds, small birds, are not worth much. Uh, they're priced at uh, five for two pennies. Now, a penny here, of course, a uh, English translation, perhaps even more of an American translation. But this coin uh, was really a, a Roman brass coin with a value of one tenth of a denarius. So that one of them was worth one sixteenth of a denarius or less than a half hour's average wage. Sparrows are one of the cheapest things sold in the market and two pennies is a very small sum. And we're talking about two for five, you know, that's probably a sale. So this may be food for the poor, but as you can see, a small bird, buying some small birds, uh, well, I guess it depends how hungry you are. Uh, you have to wonder where they already plucked, there's hardly any meat on them. But what would it be worth? Not much. The point is, God cares for them. Even though people who would hear this would say, we don't really value those small birds. Well, God does value them. He is their creator. And it even says that, notice this last line, and none of them is forgotten for God. <laughs> God does not forget these small birds. God values them. He has a value on them. He doesn't lose them. He doesn't lose track of them. He is completely aware of every bird all the time, where it is, what it's doing, what it needs, and the dangers around it. The moment it dies and falls to the ground, all in his plan. Jesus has more to say on this, but he makes his point. He will make his point after he says some more. That's what I'm trying to say. He will argue from the lesser to the greater, from a small bird of little value to people. Verse 7. In fact, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Now he goes right to people. Do not be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Begins with the terms, in fact. One more thing to say about God's awareness of you. Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. This is a way of saying that God knows everything there is to know about you. The smallest detail. The hair or lack of it on your head. He knows the exact number of hairs on your head all the time. Now I'm getting a little ridiculous here, but he does. He knows all about you all the time. And the point is, if he does not lo lose track of one of the hairs on your head, he's not going to lose track of you. 
If God knows how many hairs, he knows you intimately. And he's watching over you. Now here comes the point. Do not be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. We have another command. Do not be afraid. Present imperative. This is to be a constant state you are in. You are never to be afraid of death. Keeping that in this context. You should not be afraid because you are more valuable than many sparrows. Now anybody knows that. Well, of course, some may argue at the day who argue for so many animals being more important than people's needs. But the point here, God is everywhere. He's all-knowing and all-powerful. Not the smallest thing gets past his knowledge or gets away from him. So if God gives his attention to the smallest bird in the world, among the billions of birds, you have his attention right now and all the time. No one is even going to think about persecuting you without God being fully aware of it. No one's going to touch you unless God permits it. And it is in his plan of discipleship for you. Now, let's remember who he's talking to in the day and time in which they are. In a short time, they will be out there being bold apostles. Well, to put it one way, against the world. Whatever difficult times comes to you by way of threats or persecution or death, God has it all in hand. Now, one of the things you should be developing in your thinking at this point is your boldness. People often talk about, well, I'm just, I'm just afraid to witness. And often they're afraid to even admit that they're a Christian and they totally oppose what they're talking about. Well, these words are teaching the disciples to prepare for some rough times ahead. They have nothing to fear if they fear God above all. Now, as I said, we're going to get into a number of lessons here. We're going to get into some, well, how do I put it? Thick ones, heavy ones, important ones. Let's do a quick review of what we've just went over today as well as a little bit what we did our last lesson because I want you to get this context so we're going to go back into chapter 11 a little bit one in the last section of chapter 11 at the Pharisees dinner Jesus pronounced the woes on the religious leaders condemning them condemning for their hypocrisy as well as their rejection of the prophets and prophets, of prophets and apostles. Do you remember that? They refused the light of the word. Two, if I was to sum up a religious person in two words, it would be rejection of truth and hypocrisy. Rejection of truth and hypocrisy. Three, religious people pretend to be holy but cannot truly be holy with such a lack of truth. Four, this leads to chapter 12 which expands on the idea of hypocrisy. Five, the disciples are sternly warned about hypocrisy. Six, whatever you think, say, or do in secret will all be brought out into the open. Seven, so do not be hypocritical about your life. There's no point in it. Eight, built on this truth comes the command not to fear. Physical harm or death. The most they can do is kill you, and then you're with the Lord for standing on the truth. Hardly a better way to die. Nine, what believers should fear is not showing proper respect and loyalty towards God in these difficult times. 10. The reason you are not to fear is because just as God takes care of the smallest creatures, 
he will take much better care of you. Now this type of lesson, or I should say lesson, should fortify us in being more bold in our witness, in our avoidance of hypocrisy. I can be a little personal here. There are many types of people I don't like. Uh, now, I know we're to love all people, and we do, and we give them the gospel, and we have the opportunity, but I really don't like hypocrites. That is one of the things, and I should be thankful for this, I guess, that ran me out of one of the uh, mainstream denominations when I was a youngster. It's the hypocrisy. I don't understand. The Bible says this, that people are doing this all the time. Well, that helped me start on my uh, pursuit of truth. So God knew what he was doing. Well, with what we just saw, with these points about not to be a hypocrite and why you're not to fear, come some important lessons on confession and denial. Now, these are not easy lessons either. In verse 8, these principles are to be applied in the presence of people before men. So, you're not going to be a hypocrite. You're not going to do that before men. Listen up. Verse 8. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge him before the angels of God. All right, the first phrase, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men. This is a, uh, out in the open. The word for acknowledge, a word we've seen many times in the New Testament, homo legao. We sometimes translate it confess, profess, or claim. Before men is obviously a reference to a public acknowledgement. Public acknowledgement. It could also be before a judge in a courtroom. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before man, next phrase, the Son of Man. This is Jesus, a title he often used for himself. We've seen it many times in our gospel studies. We see it used in Luke to forgive sin, 524. Table fellowship with sinners, 734. His coming suffering, 9.22. Here it is as judge. We will see the Son of Man as judge. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. A few scriptures on that. We'll look at a couple of them. Here's some scriptures you can look up. Luke 22.69. Acts 10.42. We'll look at that one. And Acts 17.31. Let's look at those last two. Talking about Jesus as judge, here's some scripture. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Of course, that's the disciples talking about, or the apostles talking about Jesus. Acts 17, 31, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with judge justice by the man who, excuse me, by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, who else could that be but Jesus? So he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that is Jesus Christ he has appointed the one that was resurrected. Then we add this last phrase. Where it says. We'll acknowledge him before the angels of God. So the son of man also will acknowledge him before the angels of God. Now you might ask, what are angels doing there? Well, angels often are with God in heaven or in, uh, when the Lord returns to earth. So they will be with God at the last judgment. Uh, there's a well-known verse in Matthew. When Jesus returns, he'll be accompanied by angels. Matthew 25, 31. 
When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Notice, and all the angels with him. Millions of angels will accompany Jesus when he comes back. Then when he judges, there will be angels there as well. The angels will witness all this in the heavenly court. That's the idea here. Uh, Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So there those angels are again uh, for numerous ministries and service to God. Here they're being witnesses. Now we get the negative side of this. We just got the positive side, that is. Let me read verse 8 again right quick. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before man, the Son of Man will oh, Son of Man also will acknowledge him before the angels of God. The negative side, verse 9. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. The word deny, let's talk about that word. It's the aorist middle participle here of our neomai. I'm going to put all these uses up here so we can look at them at once. Our neomai is the word. Let me give you some of the uses in denying self to follow Jesus. We saw that in Luke 9.23, denying self. And denying Jesus, Matthew 10.23, Luke 9.29. Jews denying Christ before Pilate. That comes later. Peter denying association with or even knowledge of Christ. Matthew 26.69-72, Luke 22.57. John 13, 38, 18, 25, and 27. So, to deny, let's put it in this context as we've understood these other uses of it in these passages. In this context, it's the opposite of acknowledge from our previous verse. Its use is very similar for the use of ashamed we saw back in 926. Now in the aorist participle, which is what this is, it would be an accumulative amount of denials in one's lifetime. In other words, a lifetime of denial. This is one who continues through his life to deny Christ. This is a person who's rejected Christ all his life. Of course he's going to deny Christ before men. And he will get what he deserves when he's judged by God before the angels, or we might say in the presence of the angels of God. This continues through his lifetime. He's a person who constantly denies Christ. This person will be denied before the angels of God. This is a denial. This is a denial into the eternal kingdom of God. Now let's look at these two verses together and we'll talk about them. 12, 8, and 9. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. These two verses should be interpreted in this context. Let's broaden our thinking about this idea of denial. Now that we understand what it means here, 
denial here where one is denied by God uh, into the kingdom of God where he's witnessed where all this is witnessed by the angels of God has to do with one constantly denying Christ in public. Now, the context again. Let me give you some reminder points. Now, this is going to sound repetitive, but we're trying to think in terms of context. Jesus warns about hypocrisy. Everything hidden now will be uncovered. Do not fear death, but fear God. Be concerned about your private life matching your public life. God knows you and cares for you because he values you. Acknowledge God publicly so he will acknowledge you at the judgment. Those who deny God publicly will be denied at the judgment. Now sometimes we want to read more into passages than we should. But we take what it means. That's usually a, a, a major and one of the first principles of proper biblical interpretation. The simplest interpretation is most likely the correct interpretation. Now we've learned that hypocrisy is pretending to be someone you're not. But denying Christ brings eternal judgment. So what's going on here with these two teachings together? Well, here we see denial of Christ explained in the most severe case. A person who rejects Jesus as Lord, Christ, and Savior throughout his lifetime. Now remember, he is teaching his disciples. The lifetime pattern of the disciples of Jesus Christ is to be confessing or acknowledging Jesus Christ in public. To deny Christ in public is characteristic of unbelievers, not disciples. Do not be hypocritical with your faith. Do not lead the double life. That is what the religious Pharisees did. Live your life as you really are. The lesson we should be learning is we are to live on the outside what we are with within. And if we are within, growing in Christ, becoming more like our Lord and Savior, we will also grow in our boldness. And if you are not, then you need to acknowledge to yourself that you're not growing as you need to. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We all need to grow. We all need to get more bold. But you see, it's a learned process as we grow in our faith. The basic principle here is to fear what the judge can do and not men. Is that true of you? That's what you want in your attitude and in your actions. You know you have a much greater responsibility and obligation towards God whom you worship and Christ who you claim to follow than any fear that man can bring. It's about this time that people think about Peter. Well, Peter denied the Lord three times. That is absolutely right. Let's talk about Peter for a moment. There's no doubt that he was a believer as well as he publicly denied Christ three times. You look at the story, we see he did it. He lied for his own protection. But to his credit, he had come back. He was close to Jesus. I think that's because he recognized him as his Lord. What's going to happen to my Lord? But Peter wasn't ready for an arrest and crucifixion himself. So he tried to remain undercover, you might say. So what do we say about Peter in light of what we've just stated about denial? Well, first of all, 
why did people why did Peter deny well he chickened out that's rather blunt but that's to the point that's what happened he lost his nerve but you see he didn't stay that way because that's not who he was he came back he regretted his denial and he came back stronger than even uh, stronger than ever after the resurrection then when the Holy Spirit came upon believers he became one of the boldest apostles in church history so you see the difference is that Peter's denial was not a lifetime of denial it was a momentary collapse under pressure you might even say three or four three three moments under pressure and again had he confessed Christ before those people at that time he might have been hanging on a cross also so understand the main difference is is that Peter's Lord was still Jesus Christ yes he chickened out under pressure but he came back because that's who he was it wasn't a continuous denial for a lifetime and that's what happens when people continually deny Christ all their life God will deny them that wasn't Peter Now before we get to another much debated topic in the next few verses, let's put together some of the teachings that we've seen in the last couple of lessons for some application. This will help us understand the next challenging topic, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Principle, if you are not going to be a hypocrite and you're going to fear God and not man, then you will have no problem confessing Christ before everyone, even in public and pressure situations. But if you are living the life of a hypocrite, you will hide your true beliefs because of fear of the consequences. You will collapse under pressure. You need to grow out of that. Don't let that be you anymore. And I understand people are afraid to witness sometimes. You don't need to be that way. Get yourself controlled by the Spirit. Know the Word of God. You'll develop discernment. You'll know what to say. And you may be amazed at the boldness that you have. But then you'll also realize it's because of the Spirit. The fear of man and denial of Christ should never be characteristic of a serious follower of Christ. Note that I said should never be. It can happen, but it doesn't have to, especially now that you have the Spirit. So these lessons on hypocrisy and denial and putting them together, this is a warning. First it was a warning to the disciples, but it's also a warning to us. If you fall into the pattern of being a hypocrite, a hypocrite, it can lead to unbelief and even apostasy, especially when pressure comes. Now, don't miss this point. We're going to elaborate on it. If you fall into the pattern of being a hypocrite, and this is very common among religious people, along, uh, among uh, mainstream denominationalism of Christianity. But if you follow that pattern of being a hypocrite, it shows the shallowness of your faith, which can lead to unbelief and even apostasy when pressure comes. And if that's the case, if you go that far into apostasy, you will be denied by God entrance into the kingdom of God. Spiritual growth and a life of learning to live dependent on the Holy Spirit often makes the difference at those critical times. But there are no guarantees. Pressure is a test of your faith. 
All right, our last set of points on application. One. Hypocrisy is one of the biggest traps believers fall into. Now, I know a lot about this because I was trained to be hypocritical as a young Baptist believer. I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, Jesus says one thing, people do another. But people learn to play this game. It's a hypocritical game and how to be religious. Two, it's often due to not ever or refusing to depend upon the Holy Spirit for the enablement to live the Christian life and growing spiritually. And what I'm saying is people end up trying to live the Christian life on their own energy and they know they can't do it because they keep failing. So they learned to perfect their hypocrisy. And this is because they've never learned the word. They've never learned how to depend upon the Spirit. Point three, in trying to become holy in the flesh, they use their own strength constantly and constantly fall short, never growing spiritually, and they remain immature believers and learn to pretend to be something they are not. Now, some hypocrites, they fool themselves into thinking, well, this is what the Christian life is all about, so I'm going to be the best hypocrite around. And they're full of works. You see how all this is connected? I'm going to outdo the hypocrisy of another person by doing a lot of good works to cover my lust and my covetousness. Four, this becomes a lifestyle and an attitude often for life. Kind of like once a hypocrite, always a hypocrite. Doesn't have to be that way. Point five, we see what helps for them to be that way. It is supported and emulated in many Christian churches. The thinking is that if this is what all these other people are doing, then it must be right. And I'm going to be good at it. Six, this is religion. One works in the flesh to be good and do good deeds. Now, the definition of good and good deeds here is not the biblical definition, but rather the worldly definition. Seven, this is important, it's often accompanied with self-righteousness, do-goodism, and judgmentalism. Uh, this is a Pharisee, by the way. These are religious leaders in all kinds of religions across the board. You name the religion, this is often part of it. They do good. There are some who are much more judgmental, in fact, even go to war because they think they're so right. Uh, think about the religion during Jesus' day. Two biggest religious groups couldn't get along because they had different values of what do-goodism was. That was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had their own opinions on what they should be doing in their religions. See the same thing among denominationalism, uh, among many religions that have all the branch. You see it among the Muslims, all the different branches of Muslims. They divide over leaders. They divide over value systems, uh, what they conceive as truth. I've found that sometimes people want to debate with Muslims over Allah, for example, or, the, or their uh, what they call their Bible. And you've got to understand that, first of all, what they call Allah is not the God of the Bible. And what they call Scripture is not the Word of God. 
and when they start saying it's Allah's will, that's not the God creator, the God of the Bible. So when they start talking about their uh, the Quran or and what they think of Jesus, it's a contorted view when they talk about Jesus. How could it not be? They reject truth. So I give them as one obvious illustration, but the ones that's usually closest to us, the most dangerous to us, is just denominationalism Christianity. It's set up to make one feel good about doing his own works in the flesh. If you don't believe that, go up and ask one of them, how do you become controlled by the Spirit? Just ask them that. See what little they know. Now some may have it right, but for the most part you're going to find that people who are religious don't understand this. They don't understand the idea of being controlled by the Spirit constantly. They need to confess your sins, to stay in fellowship with God, to maintain your walk with God. They basically want to do it out of the works of the flesh on their own. And that's what their friends do, that's what mom and dad did, and their grandparents, we've been going to this church for four generations, and old brother so-and-so couldn't be wrong, and all my friends and relatives and neighbors. Point seven is an important point. There's a self-righteousness. We're right, you're wrong. We're gonna do lots of good deeds for people in the community and the poor and all of this. Now, the Bible certainly teaches take care of the poor, but properly motivated by the Spirit walking with God. Judgmentalism, well, you're going to nail everybody who doesn't believe what you believe. Eight, the hypocritical and religious Christian who really is a Christian, all right, let's make sure we understand that, who really is a Christian, is in spiritual danger of falling away from Christ under intense pressure. Now, add what we just learned. They're going to be denying. <laughs> denying. They're going to be deniers, and they will deny Christ under pressure. We'll see a lot of that if we're present during the tribulation. A lot of Christians are going to deny Christ. They've lived religious, hypocritical lives, and now, under the gun, when they're told if you're a Christian, you die, they will back out and they will enter into apostasy in many cases. Well, a lot of important lessons there, and I know I dwelt on some of those topics over and over because I see, as Jesus warned, guard yourselves from that hypocrisy. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you for your word today. It's been challenging in many ways. Help us get out of our lives what hypocrisy there is, to realize the danger of it, to avoid it, to expose it, and never deny you in any way, but continue all our lifetime to confess you as Lord and Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.